Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 159. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. I'm so glad you're back. We have an awesome guest today lined up. Before we get into the show, if you haven't yet, please go over and hit subscribe on whichever platform you're listening on, and you'll be notified of new episodes every week, just like this one. Well, this week's guest is return guest Joseph Goslin. Joseph first aired on the podcast back in March of this year, 2018, in episode 89. Well, Joseph shared his story about originating in Israel, buying his very first condo there, immigrating to the United States, and then becoming a multifamily investor. Today, we're going to be catching up with Joseph, talking market trends in his tertiary markets of Lubbock, Texas, where he invests, and just his general outlook on the market. Without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. All right, today I welcome back on the show, Mr. Joseph Goslin. Joseph, hey, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate the callback. Hey, yeah, it's our pleasure. Well, hey, Joseph, you last appeared on the podcast back in March of 2018 this year on episode 89. So here we are about 70 episodes later. So I know you've been up to a lot of new stuff. I wanted to have you back on and just kind of catch up and talk about what's new and uh, yeah, talk some real estate. So yeah, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. So for our audience members that missed that episode, I recommend you go back, check out Joseph's story. Really inspiring. But Joseph, could you just kind of give us a recap of your background, how you got started in the world of real estate investing, and just tell the audience members a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I'll do it quickly because I don't want to bother the fans that's been listening to you and know the story. But I grew up in Israel. I went to the military over there. I did my engineering school over there. And I relocated to the United States in 2007. I started investing in real estate in 2005 when my wife and I kind of read Reach That Poor Dad. We bought a, uh, a home for ourselves and then realized, wait a second, it's too big with just the two of us. No kids, no nothing. So we decided to rent it out until we we're ready to uh, start our family. And then, you know that real estate bug catches you, right? When you start seeing that income and the benefits come in um, and, you know, you pay the mortgage and there's some some of it left over, that's really awesome. So that's where we got the real estate bug. And then when we came to the States in 07, it was kind of like we realized that it's probably the best time of our lives to invest, right? When the market was flat out at crashing. Um, so we sold the, the property back home and we moved the money over here and we started investing over here. Um, and then we've done a few singles over the years. Uh, we got licensed, both me and my wife, uh, and really, um, realized that in 2015, I realized that single families are just not scalable. And, and that was just a long story. I had to pay tens of thousands of dollars on one of my properties and the engineer in me said, there's got to be something better. So I went out and I researched every possible thing on earth and then some uh, and landed on multifamily. So that's where our multifamily journey really started. Yeah. So for quite some time, you, you kind of played in that single family space. And then in about 2015, was it you transitioned into the multifamily arena and then, you know, kind of took off from there. And some of those driving factors were really that scalability. So you kind of had that engineering mindset, which I can appreciate, you know, looking at your current portfolio thinking, 
hey, this is pretty difficult. There's been some really high expenses on some of these properties and I need to kind of get some of that scalability. So 2015 rolls around, you decide you're going to roll into the multifamily arena. So last we talked, you know, you had several hundred units under your belt or maybe it's about a hundred to 200. And now you've really taken off and been doing some recent deals. So I wanted to kind of talk to you about, you know, what's new in your portfolio and what you're seeing. Maybe talk some market trends, what you're seeing in today's market, how you're underwriting deals. I know it's a lot there, but just kind of walk us through what's new with you since since we last talked. Yeah, sure. So when we just when we last talked, we just acquired another 97 unit, um, and since then we've been renovating and putting a lot of money into the property. Uh, we've done paint and parking lots and interiors and roofs and, and anything you can think of, and that's these properties are already after the 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 lowest uh, uh, valley that you get to when you come into a new property and you got to do all that work and you got to evict the people that hasn't paid and uh, you got to turn around the reputation and the clientele that comes into that property so we we passed the bottom on that one and and we're, we're on the rise up already with these and that's fantastic and then we had another acquisition. We had a small one in the middle, and then we had another big acquisition last July of 236-unit property. And that one is our biggest to date, and it was a very exciting process to go through. Uh, um, and uh, I had a lot of lessons learned from that one as well. Um, the, the interesting one is uh, uh, lenders become really, really nice to you when you cross the $10 million loan threshold <laughs> yeah so, that's uh, uh but but really we went through that one and uh we just started renovating that one as well so um we have about 400 units right now 350 units that are in process uh, of renovation yeah sure and now you're investing in these sexy markets like san francisco seattle new york right yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, for us, hope is not a strategy. And all the markets that you just named are, are hope-based investment. Um, when you're negative cash flow, uh, you're banking on appreciation. That's all you do. And um, hope is, is not part of our strategy. So we invest in Texas. All of our units are in Texas. Uh, we don't even invest in the core markets like Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. Um, and the only reason for that is not that I have anything against these cities. It's just we've been priced out of it. Uh, there's true. a lot of competition. There's a lot of foreign money. There's a lot of uh, um, uh, some education groups that are encouraging people to just buy. Uh, and um, we can't compete with that. So we went out and we started looking. And when we started uh, in 2016 and we started looking at secondary markets, everybody looked at me like, you're crazy. And now everybody in the industry talking about we got to go to secondary markets. We're looking at secondary markets, so it's uh, uh, it's it's an interesting transition to see the industry go through. Yeah, and you and I kind of talk about these markets sometimes offline. You know, your properties are primarily in Lubbock, you know, whereas I invest primarily in Oklahoma and some of overlapping Texas panhandles. So, and some people would even call these tertiary markets. So, you know, I like to talk to you about, you know, what you're seeing in those markets and if there's anything different in, in those types of markets that you see versus, you know, in these primary markets and the way you underwrite and analyze deals. So, now, what are you seeing in, in your markets today that might be different from what people are seeing in these kind of primary class A markets? Yeah, so for me, the critical aspect of selecting a market is jobs. Sure. Where are the jobs? Uh, and, and that is because we're investing in the B and C class environment. And most of our residents, like most of Americans, live paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. So we have to be in a market where if one of our residents loses their jobs for whatever reason, they can find a new job within a week or two. Because if they can't, you're going to have to evict them. It's, it's, it's a sad fact of life, but they don't have any reserves to afford them to pay two months rent without a job. So that's really where the key factors are for us is, is looking for low unemployment rate, great job creation, continuous economic drivers, 
So Lubbock for us is fantastic because it's 2.7% unemployment rate, 2.8. It's been hovering around there for the last uh, two years, consistently below Texas and definitely below the country. Um, other markets like that in Texas are Waco or uh, Amarillo um, and so on. If you'll go to, there are certain markets out there that I've hear a lot of buzz, like, I don't know, Cleveland that, that get six, 7% unemployment rate. This can get you in trouble really fast if there's any hiccup with the economy or, you know, just life. People, you know, have life. Uh, you got sick of your boss or you pissed off your boss or you missed work because you got to go somewhere and your boss fires you. People lose their jobs all the time. And if they can't turn around and really quickly find a new job, they're going to be in a financial problem that could inflict on you as the property owner. Yeah, sure. And jobs are one of the most important factors when looking at markets. As you say, your tenants have to have jobs in order to pay the rent there. There have been lots of people recently following Amazon's pending announcement of where they're going to locate the new HQ2. There's been some talk about they're going to split it up. People are always following these high profile employers. In these secondary and tertiary markets, like where you and I invest, you oftentimes don't have these glamorous Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies, but you can still find places where the unemployment rate is very low. People have jobs. And then, you know, in markets like Lubbock, there's the university, they've got healthcare system and things like that. So, is there any driving demand? Is that why you invest in Lubbock? Does it have any factor on, on your decision there? Yes, absolutely. Uh, um, the reason we love this town, the reason the unemployment is so low is the university is the big dog in town. They have over 37,000 students. And while we don't do student housing, we do workforce housing, the math is very simple. For every four or five students the university add, uh, there's another job in town. So Texas Tech is responsible for about 13,000 jobs in town, about $1.2 billion to the city economy every year. Just shopping alone, the students are doing over $300 million in retail shopping. So that's really where uh, the big driver is. But the other big driver in Lubbock is the, uh, the medical facility. So the university has deployed a lot of cash, research, technology, and, and people into the medical facility that over time it became its own thing. It became the most advanced and sophisticated hospital in the hundred mile radius. So now it generates its own economy. It brings patients from out of town. It brings money from out of town. The families, the, the people that come with the patients that spend money in town and requires accommodation, requires everything. So um, it's its own thing right now, independently from the university. Yeah, sure. Now, Joseph, I know you're a value-add investor. You you buy primarily Class C apartments, like you called them, workforce housing for you know predominantly blue-collar workforce. Now, what kind of value-add opportunities are you seeing in these secondary, tertiary markets, however we want to define it? Are you doing any kind of unique stuff in your markets? Talk to us about that side of things. Yeah, so the only difference between the secondary markets and the main markets is really um, the fact that there is more realistic owners over there than uh, in the major cities. But the structures are the same structures. The construction is the same construction. The, uh, um, if it's neglected, it's neglected. If it's a management problem, it's a management problem. It doesn't matter if it's Dallas or Lubbock. It's a management problem, right? So uh, in that fact, we're not that different. There is different aspect of how we do the value add. But for the most part, the opportunities are the same. It's always bad management, deferred maintenance, uh, bad reputation, or neglect. And, and this is where we step in. We either do uh, exterior rehab, interior rehab, management play, all of the above. Uh, um, it, we do whatever we can. Uh, for us, the size of the project doesn't scare us. It's only a dollar sign. So the only thing that will make us walk away from a property is location. Everything else is a dollar sign. Yeah, I like that. That's kind of interesting. And no, you're right. You know, people want the same things, whether they're in Dallas or Oklahoma City or San Francisco or Lubbock, Texas. They want, you know, clean, safe, affordable housing. And you're just identifying opportunities where you can go in and make that happen for those people. So 
Yeah, I really like that. So, you know, kind of changing gears here a little bit, like many people, you started out, like you said, with that initial condo as your investment. So we're backing up way here, you know, backing up to your early days of investing. You know, I want to kind of walk through and talk about how you transitioned to multifamily, just kind of that mindset. And, you know, can people do what you've done is essentially what I want to know. Well, yes, I've done it. I know a lot of people that have done it, right? So it's possible. It's just that um, you got to be willing to sacrifice. I've done my first purchase, which was 22 units, my first syndication, which was 102 units. And I had my second syndication, 97 units under contract, all while having a full-time job, right? So it's doable. It's not fun. It's not easy. <laughs> uh, um, it's, it's nights. It's weekends. It's missing some school events. It's missing some family event. It's definitely putting stress on you and the family but it's doable, right? And when you get to the point where you can uh, comfortably take that leap of faith that uh, um, you can quit your day job and, and do this 100% uh, of your time, that's a, diff that, that's a great feeling, right? Uh, uh, but it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen with just buying a 10-unit property. It just takes a lot of effort and a lot of sacrifice, but it's doable. Yeah, sure. So walk us through that 22 unit, that very first multifamily you bought. How'd you do it? What was going through your mind at the time? You know, that's a big leap from where you were at the time. So kind of walk us through that very first deal. Yeah. So um, it, the first deal is always the hardest. And, and that's true for everything in life. The first everything is hard. Think about it the first time you go to school, the first time you have a test, the first time you get the, your first car, your first girlfriend, your first uh, uh, um, university class, right? Every for the first job, every first is hard. Yeah, sure. So, so it's the same thing over here. Um, I tried talking to brokers, which obviously ignored me completely. <laughs> uh, um, I tried working with uh, um, commercial mortgage brokers. I tried to find other ways. I tried to network. I tried a lot of things to find. Honestly, at the end of the day, I said, I'm not getting anything out of these guys. I'm going to source it myself. So um, I'm a broker as well, right? Like I said, I got licensed in, in 09 and we focus solely on commercials. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to go source it. And I did yellow letters and I did postcards and I did cold calling. And I talked to a few owners uh, that were um, overly optimistic. Let's just say that. Uh, <laughs> or, or Maybe in rare perspective, they were realistic about what the market would offer them, but I was not ready to offer them that sure. until I until I came upon one of them that called me back out of a postcard, no less. I said, "Yeah, you you send me a postcard. I got a property. Let's talk." And and that's how it started. It was an eighty year old guy. Wow. Um, uh, one of the the most amazing people I've ever met is is like the World War II generation, right? The people that give you a handshake and you know you know it's done, uh, they mean it, right? They mean it. Uh, and we, I went out, I visited the property, I visited him, I sat down with him, we started building a report, and and that's really what it was. It was building a relationship with that guy that got me this property. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, you were able to find this property in a little bit of a unique sense. You know, you talk about, you know, working with brokers and, you know, trying to find, you know, deals through that avenue just wasn't panning out on your first deal, which is common for a lot of people out there, you know, not getting calls back or emails back from those brokers, because at this point, you're an unproven investor. So you kind of took control into your own hands. Well, you had the uh, license to go along with it, you know, so that helped a lot, but you know, you started sourcing deals yourself. So I really like that. You were going to find a way to make it work. Kind of found this unique, uh, 22 unit owned by this 80 year old man, just ready to get rid of it. So yeah, that's, that's really cool. Now kind of the mindset shift, what was going on in your mind at the time, you know, going from where you were to that 22 unit is a big leap, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of trepidations. What'd you do to kind of overcome those and just kind of take that jump and take on that deal? Yeah, well, like I mentioned, I'm an engineer, and when I made that decision that I'm going to switch over to something else uh, than singles, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of legwork. I, I read everything online I could put my hands on. I listened to every podcast. 
I, I read every book and, and, and talked to anyone I could uh, to get as much information as I can. And um, I know there's a lot of education groups out there that offer a shortcut uh, that will give you everything that you need. I'm the kind of person that needs to do the hard work themselves uh, <laughs> and, and learn the hard way. So that's what I went through. But uh, um, uh, I, that's how I got into it. And, and I built my, uh, um, um, my underwriting sheet and I built my knowledge and I, I put everything together and the numbers made sense. And, and I'm an engineer, so Excel is, is one of my favorite tools, right? So um, it went into the Excel and it made sense and it set, set well with me. So I had a lot more comfort in moving forward because I'm the kind of person that, um, if you know the disk test, right? Uh, yeah. So I'm 100% on the D. <laughs> it's, as, it's as high as it can get. So <laughs> when when I decide to do something, I'm going to do it. I might take a while to research and, and know that I know what I need to know um, before I can take my first step. When, when I feel ready, I take action. I just don't sit and think about it or, or dream about it. So, yeah. so I was ready to pull the trigger and the right opportunity came along and the numbers were right. Then I just pulled the trigger. Yeah, I'm a lot like you in that sense, Joseph. And another thing I like to say is, I say quite a bit, is the best way to hedge against risk is education. So, you know, you said you spent a lot of time educating yourself, just consuming everything you can get your hands on from books to podcasts. And I'm sure that period took you quite a while. You didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to buy a multifamily and the next day close on it, right? So you probably spent a good amount of time in this kind of education, education phase that is. So is that right? It was a, a little over a year. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So that's a lot of time of just studying and, you know, kind of putting your nose down into the grindstone and reading and listening and networking. So yeah, I'm kind of like you in that sense. It takes me a long time to kind of, you know, get ready to pull the trigger. But once I decide I'm going to, you know, it's kind of all in. So yeah, I think that, uh, you know, resonates well with a lot of the audience members out there. You know, you see these gurus come to town or whatever it is and promise almost overnight success or very quick success. And then really all reality it doesn't really work like that. You know, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication to get to a point like where you are. Yeah. So what I like to tell people is that there's no good and bad in education, right? So the education piece could be good. You just got to walk into it with open eyes, right? When you walk into somebody else's business, you got to understand what their business model is. And a lot of these groups uh, will practically guarantee you'll do a transaction. And that means they cannot afford you going around next year saying, well, I paid twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and I didn't do a transaction. So suddenly all the Excel files you get, all the advice that you get, all the people you get to meet are focused on getting you to make a transaction. Not necessarily a good or, or a great one, but a transaction. So um, if you walk into this environment knowing that you're there for the education, but the guys around you have a financial interest in you making a transaction and you know how to hedge against that, it might be a good shortcut uh, uh, to, to figuring it out on your own. But if you go in blindly trusting that whatever you're told is awesome and great and it's true and you know those rosy glasses they put on you when you went in is is uh, uh is how the world looks like you might find yourself and your investors in trouble in, in the next few years yeah anytime somebody's selling something you really have to you know take into consideration what their bias is you know like you said is it just to do a transaction might not be a good transaction good or bad transaction is their goal so yeah it's right just you know kind of understanding you know who you're getting your information from whether that's good information or bad information yeah really valuable there so well joseph you've grown exponentially since last time we talked like we mentioned earlier in the show what's next for you you know what's the future hold for ebg that's your your uh, business eureka business group that is so what does the future hold for you and what are your next plans yeah, so right now we're focusing on execution. Um, like I said, we have over 350 units that are uh, um, in some sort of rehab right now. So there's a lot going on. 
And um, once we get a little bit of that dust settled, then we'll focus back on acquisitions. What we see around in the market right now, it doesn't mean we stopped underwriting, right? We still get deals all day long and we still underwrite everything, but it's getting very, very hard to find something that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of 2015, 2016 product that comes back on the market that was transaction in 15 and 16 and people did their value add and, and they're trying to sell it right now. And, um, it's going to be interesting to see how the market is, is developing over the next six to 18 months. Um, you mentioned the Amazon HQ2, there is literally billions of dollars sitting on the sidelines. And I, and I know some of those hedge funds that I, I get to talk to them in industry events, and they're just sitting on the sidelines with tons of cash ready to pounce the minute somebody makes an announcement. So um, it's like winning the lottery, right? Whoever has a property in that area is going to win the lottery. Every, whoever thinks he's going to go and compete against these companies is dreaming. Um, you know, us mere mortals are going to uh, <laughs> maybe get some scraps after the, the big dogs come in and, and sweep through whatever they, they can take. Um, but um, at this point of our cycle and, and with the way the market is looking, we're very, very cautious about um, our underwriting um, and, and which properties and which market we're willing to take on. Yeah, sure. And you're playing a different game than these folks with billions of dollars on the sideline, these hedge funds. Like you said earlier in the show, hope is not your strategy. And, you know, that's what those guys are kind of doing is, you know, waiting on, you know, these big announcements to go in and they've got just different investment metrics, you know, and they've got different uh, criteria. So, you know, you're not playing the same game. You're playing, you know, your game sticking to it and the markets that make sense for you. So, yeah, I think that's a really important takeaway for people listening out there. Yeah, and, and you know, um, it, it seems like the same game from the outside, but when you really drill down into the way this uh, is, is being played, then no two syndicators, not two investors are playing the same game. They all have different strategies. They all have different exit strategies. Uh, they all have different hold period. Uh, anyone that is willing intentionally to say, I'm going to hold this for 30 years, can overpay today and still make a lot of money in the future. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, um, there is in Dallas, I've seen recently some transactions by uh, Japanese uh, uh, foreign people uh, because they have a tax rule back home that says if they buy a property over 20 something years old, they can write off the entire purchase within two to three years. I didn't know that. So I've seen a $30 million transaction coming in, paid in cash at less than four cap. They don't care if this <laughs> yeah. thing is going to make money. They don't have investors to pay. They're going to take $30 million off their tax liability in the next two, three years. Yeah. So just because we both might be looking at a $30 million transaction willing to buy, I can't compete with them because their strategy is completely different than mine, right? So um, I say to people, stick to your guns, stick to your numbers, because if you'll try to compete with somebody that has a different strategy, you will lose your shirt. Yeah, sure, sure. Now, what does your crystal ball say for the future, Joseph? You know, with the Fed's impending rate hikes uh, over the next year, I think they've got, what, three more scheduled rate hikes in 2019, I believe. So, you know, what does your outlook look like? Anything you're doing to, you know, change that or uh, cope with those things? Oh, I can't change that. Well, That's for sure. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, really, I don't have a crystal ball. All I can is look at um, the market, look how the market shifts and behaves, right? If you look at the DFW area, like I said, I'm a broker, so I get access to systems like the RDNC, the rent and the occupancy. And you can see the rents in 2014, 15, 16, going up and up and up, and 17 going up. But almost everybody in 2018 took a step back. And it's kind of like we pushed the rent as far as we could. And then the market says, ah, I can't. So everybody had to take a step back in 2018. Uh, I think 2019, there's going to be a lot of conversation about affordability. Because, again, people keep being... All the education groups out there will teach you, go buy a rundown C-class property, upgrade 
everything and push the rent up a hundred, two hundred dollars a door. Well, it's all fun and great until you get to the realization that rents in Dallas, for example, went up twenty something percent in the last three, four years, but wages went up two, three percent. Mm-hmm. At the end of the rainbow, there's a human being that's going to have to pay the rent, and and if you push it beyond their capability, you're not going to get your returns on investment because they won't be able to pay that. Yeah, so sure. that's really where uh, we always, as a strategy, try to keep some of our units classic versus upgraded. Um, and we also, we can balance between occupancy and max rent. And um, we're always watching on, you know, brokers performer that promises that everything will be rainbows and lollipops. And then you can push $200 a door and it's kind of like, okay, then, you know, I might not be able to achieve that um, if everybody around me is, is taking a step back. Yeah, sure. Definitely. So yeah, well, interesting to hear market insights and just kind of what you're doing and what you're seeing in the markets in today's environment. Now, as we're wrapping up here, any parting piece of advice you'd like to leave with the audience members, any, any kind of news you'd like to tell anybody or any kind of advice? Well, I literally, a minute before we got on this call, got a, a an article that says that somebody leaked the new HQ2, speaking of a location, okay. uh, and that's uh, somewhere outside D.C. Yes, I've heard so, that somewhere. Is it Crystal City, Virginia? Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, if I don't know if it's news or rumors, but that's uh, that's what I just got. <laughs> well, you heard it first here from Joseph Goslin, yeah. <laughs> Crystal City. Take all your billions on the sideline and put it there, I guess, right? <laughs> there you go. Yes. Uh, no, but really, uh, the best advice is don't uh, um, compromise on your underwriting. Uh, and, and that's what I've seen people do over and over when they get into bidding wars or they get into some crazy transactions, putting half a million dollar hard day one without early access. It's kind of like, you know, there's a lot of people that are, can afford doing mistakes this size, but there's a lot of people that are gambling with other people's money that shouldn't be taking those gambles. So if you're out there and you're doing, uh, just take care of your investors, watch out for them. Uh, don't get caught up in the hype. Yeah, I love it. Well, Joseph, it's been a lot of fun having you back on, talking with you. Always a good time. For people who want to learn more about you, connect with you, where's the best place for them to find you? Yeah, ebgacquisitions.com. Uh, That's our website. Um, a shorter version is ebgtx.com. Just five letters. And uh, I'm very visible on social media. You can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Just reach out. I'm very uh, approachable. Yeah, I love it. And you also have a recent book that you authored. Tell us just a quick little snippet about that. Well, actually, that book is is a little bit older. Uh, it's the Real Estate College Fund. And uh, it's just a way to help people realize that real estate can be a good thing for them, a good alternative for a college fund for the kids. Instead of paying out of their pocket every month into a college fund, they can have a college fund that pays them every month. Um, and when the kids are older, um, 18 years later, just hand them over the keys and say, hey, you want to use the rent, use the rent. You want to uh, sell it, sell it. Uh, but here's your college fund, especially with uh, college costs are, that are getting higher and higher every year. Um, so um, I don't think there's another book out there that lists all the risks that come with investing in real estate. <laughs> and um, offers mitigation. So I'm not just a naysayer, right? I offer mitigation strategies for every one of those risks that I'm listing over there. Uh, it's a short 100 and something pages, very quick read. Um, but I'm actually on working on my second book right now, uh, which is going to be titled The 401k Scam. Oh, I like That's it. Be an interesting <laughs> one. Uh, when it comes out, I'll be happy to come again on your show and, and talk about that. Yeah, definitely. Well, for the audience members that want to check Joseph out, learn more about what he's doing, you can visit EBG, that stands for EurekaBusinessGroup.com. An alternative to that is EBG Texas. And Joseph, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, it's EBGTX.com, not just EBG. Sorry. EBGTX.com. That's right. All right. Got it. Love it. Joseph, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Look forward to having you back on when you release that new book. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. All 
right, that wraps up this week's episode with our guest, Joseph Goslin. I really hope you're getting value from this podcast and these guest interviews. If you like what you've heard, please go over and leave a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening on. For more information, resources, and to connect with me, you can visit www.jacobayers.com. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.